Hello again, and uh, I'm Lars Svensson, Chairman of the Heart and Vascular and Thoracic Institute, and with me today are Sega Kalahasti and Melin Desai, uh, experts in aortic diseases, and we love talking about aortic disease, and we have a very big program here at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, last year, we actually did, despite COVID, 1,381 aortic operations, the, by far the biggest in the world and um, we have a very active program and we see a lot of emergencies, urgent uh, patients needing surgery and also elective operations. In fact, uh, as of December last year, we had done 1,113 uh, modified reimplantations of the aortic valve and I was just looking at data this morning with 214 patients with connective tissue disorders. We have not had a death after that operation and there is no significant difference in our hands as far as the durability of these reimplantation operations and preserving the aortic valve between connective tissue disorders and non-connective tissue disorders. That's hot off the press. I saw it this morning and that's in 214 patients. So really good results. For the general population without connective tissue disorders, we're also running a 97% freedom from reoperation at 10 years after surgery. And for elective surgery operations, we've only had one death out of 860. So uh, about a 0.1%, one in a thousand risk of death. For a very complicated operation, that only a few of us do in the country. So we're going to start off by talking about what size should you operate on a patient and do the uh, symptoms make any influence on this? What about body size? Does it make a difference for aortic root, bicuspid valves, age, family history or family history of aortic dissection? I'll start off with you, Melind, and a uh, lot of uh, issues in that decision making. This is a very interesting question, and the, the answer is not a one-size-fits-all answer. Uh, the first and foremost thing I'm going to say and emphasize, as Dr. Swenson mentioned, experience is key. Having the right team of folks taking care of you is probably more important than anything else, especially more important than any other disease, uh, the synchrony of how the teams operate. So having said that, the thresholds are, yes, there is nuanced decision making about thresholds. Most people, you are going to be hearing numbers of five centimeters or higher, five and a half centimeters or higher. These are fairly common numbers in terms of thresholds you're going to be hearing. But there is substantial nuance uh, decision making and thought process behind how we send patients for an operation. Clearly, you are reaching 5.5 centimeters, that's a no-brainer. But what about if you are somebody who's barely five foot tall uh, and your aorta is 4.8 centimeters uh, in the ascending portion? Do, you have this, uh, do we have the same threshold as if, uh, versus somebody who is six foot one? The answer is clearly no. So very often, precision of measurement is crucial. And once we are precise in measurement, we often index your aortic area to your height. And we have multiple publications that have shown that that adds incremental value beyond pre, uh, just simple dimension measurement. So uh, a ratio, if your uh, aortic area to height ratio happens to be more than 10, then uh, data have shown, large scale data have shown that you are better off getting operated at an experience center with such stellar outcomes uh, preemptively before your aorta reaches five or five and a half centimeters. The other uh, important group is those with uh, familial uh, predisposition, so especially those with Marfans or those with Aller uh, Danlos or uh, you know any familial diseases the threshold, Lois Dietz uh, syndrome, the threshold needs to be much lower than five uh, centimeters. And it often is. Uh, if you have a malignant family history of multiple family members dying of a dissection, uh, then we are gonna not wait for uh, 
the standard threshold, we would recommend getting operated earlier. Uh, uh, the other group is patients with valve disease who need to have a heart surgical operation. Then the threshold that we use is 4.5 centimeters. So if you are undergoing uh, aortic valve surgery or mitral valve surgery, and if your ascending aorta is more than four and a half centimeters, then uh, we would recommend getting the aorta replaced at the time of that operation. So it is not one size fits all. There is nuanced thought processes. Uh, your height related, your uh, malignancy of your family history related, whether or not you need concomitant history. And also, you know, at an experience center like ours, we are more inclined to, to initiate the operation conversation once you reach at a five centimeter threshold. Uh, there are plenty of patients who have careers that are not conducive to walking around with a significantly aneurysmal aorta. So in those uh, patients, we would recommend an earlier operation, especially if done by an experienced center uh, in, um, by an experienced surgeon. So Sagar, um, would you like to add to that in particular in relation to age, uh, the size of the aortic root versus the ascending aorta and patients with bicuspid valves? Thanks, Dr. Svensson. Um, in bicuspid valve patients, again, there are certain phenotypes, you know, particularly with the aortic root being involved or aortic root being aneurysmal. I think it's um, data has shown that operating at smaller sizes, particularly in conjunction if they have aortic valve regurgitation, uh, definitely makes, um, makes a significant amount of difference for those patients. Um, in other conditions, such as in you know, Marfan's or Louis Dietz, of course, you know, we would operate at much smaller sizes, more into the 4 to 4.3 centimeter range. And in Marfan's, again, I think the thresholds will continue to come down. I think current recommendations would say about 5 centimeters, uh, but probably less than that if there is any family history of dissection at smaller sizes in those, uh, in those family members. So um, I think that's, uh, that's important to uh, keep in mind. So we looked at uh, just over 1,100 of our patients with bicuspid valves and an aorta more than 4.7 centimeters in size. And we found that the risk of aortic dissection increases at about five centimeters diameter for the aortic root and for the ascending aorta about 5.2 but we found the best predictor of dissection occurring was the ratio. In other words, as uh, Malin mentioned, the cross-sectional area divided by the patient's height in meters when that was above 10. And the other important point is when we followed these patients out to 10 years, the bigger the size they started off with, the more likely they were eventually to need an operation. So that also comes into our thinking. We also consider what's happening with the bicuspid valve. Is it a valve that's diseased? Is it a valve that maybe will last uh, a few more years and we can use a biological valve in the, at the time of surgery? And the replacement, so that also comes in uh, to our thinking. So in uh, 2010, I was involved in writing the thoracic aorta guidelines uh, uh, sponsored by the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology and Surgical Societies. And we recommended surgery at about five centimeters for most patients with bicuspid valves and Marfan syndrome, but also using the ratio. Uh, older patients who don't have any risk factors and ascending aorta, certainly a larger size, can be watched. Uh, then uh, later, the valve guidelines came out and recommended 5.5 centimeters, which resulted in a lot of confusion. And the two groups then got together. And at that stage, we had published our series on bicuspid valves. And the recommendations then came out that were modified and that are in the latest valve guidelines now also. So the cutoff is five centimeters in diameter, particularly if the root is involved and the operation can be done at the center of excellence, then, then it's reasonable to operate. And that's more or less what we use. If there are other risk factors, particularly family history of aortic dissection, then we operate at a smaller size. Now, this is, in a sense, a prophylactic operation. We do before aortic dissection happens because if an aortic dissection 
happens, then that usually results, first of all, in a very high mortality rate with a dissection. There's new research confirming again that the risk of death is 1% per hour in patients who have aortic dissection if they don't die immediately and they're awaiting surgery. And then on top of that, if they have a successful operation and the mortality rate for an operation for acute dissection varies from around about 5 to 6 percent here at the Cleveland Clinic, but in the IRAD database it used to be up to 21 percent. And then if people get through that, they have typically multiple operations after that. So it's very important to have the prophylactic operation if the aorta is enlarged. So the obvious question is, well, does it prevent aortic dissection? So we looked at some 660 of our patients who had root surgery, not all of them re-implantations, and the risk of developing a later dissection, typically in the descending aorta, so the area not operated on, was 1.4%, and the most important risk factor for that was Marfan syndrome. So it does reduce the risk of subsequent uh, dissection, and in patients who don't have a connective tissue disorder, they can, can go back to completely normal lifestyle. And even in the Marfan syndrome or Erler-Danlos patients or Lowe's Dietz patients, depending on what the activity they're planning to do, they can live a normal lifestyle. And in fact, our data shows a normal life expectancy in those patients once they've undergone their operations. So there are some surgical operation questions, so I'm going to ask, uh, answer those directly. So what is surgery and what is available for the ascending aorta? So if it's only the ascending aorta and not involving the aortic valve, we will typically do what we call a mininvasive J incision. And so that's an incision about three centimeters long in the upper chest and we make it sort of like a trap door we go in and we put in a plastic tube, it's actually a polyester, it used to be called Dacron, and we replace the aorta with that, we sew it into position, and we know that the results of that are very good. In fact, if you look at our patients with bicuspid valves who had aortic replacements, the risk of another aortic operation uh, within 15 years of the original operation it's only 2%. That's separate from the aortic valve. The aortic valve is a separate issue. So what if the aortic valve bicuspid valve is involved? Well, then it depends what the problem is with the bicuspid valve. And uh, just to segue a bit to my cardiology colleagues here, in a bicuspid valve, when do you operate for a valve that's narrowed down? I'll ask that of Melind. And for a leaking valve, I'll ask Sagar to uh, answer that question. Melind, a stenotic valve. As Dr. Swenson mentioned, uh, bicuspid aortic valves, uh, it is where essentially there are two leaflets, two flappers rather than three, and this tends to be an inherited situation. So there's two... Uh, Typically what the natural history of a bicuspid aortic valve is it progressively gets calcified or calcium buildup happens and when patients reach typically in their late 50s, early 60s, it gets severely narrowed uh, to a point where it then is impeding the flow of blood out of the heart which essentially results in symptoms. Symptoms often involve shortness of breath, chest pain, dizziness, occasionally passing out and if you leave it untreated, then it results in uh, heart failure-like symptoms. So once the aortic valve gets narrow to a severe level, uh, so there's cutoffs, there's thresholds, uh, there's uh, severity, it could be an absolute number of uh, less than one centimeter square or 0.7 centimeter square would be critical. Uh, you can uh, index it to height given uh, the discrepancies in various heights. You can index it to height. Either way, once it reaches severe in terms of valve area, there's another way of ascertaining severity is through gradient. Gradient is a pressure difference between uh, the aorta and the heart uh, because of a severely narrowed uh, aortic valve. Once these thresholds reach beyond severe is typical, uh, typically when we start thinking about an operation, especially in the context of uh, symptoms. There's emerging data now that 
waiting for symptoms, uh, maybe waiting a bit too long. So we are developing new biomarkers like blood tests, like BNP, strain values, uh, et cetera. These things can help guide decision making about timing of an operation. But once it clearly reaches severe, uh, in terms of narrowing is the time for it to operate. Now, there may be certain scenarios where we may operate in a moderately narrowed valve. If the patient is undergoing surgery for other reasons like bypass or mitral valve disease or something else, then we may operate, replace that aortic valve even if it is moderately narrowed. But generally, we wait for severe uh, valve disease, severe stenosis, severe narrowing of the aortic valve before uh, repairing. Uh, replacing. Sagar, what about a regurgitant valve, leaking valve? Thanks, Dr. Swenson. Um, just like Melinth had mentioned, aortic valve regurgitation also, um, there are parameters with regards to looking at the severity of the valve regurgitation, you know, with mild, moderate, and severe. And if the valve reaches severe range, uh, then in general, um, aortic valve intervention is recommended. You know, keep in mind with aortic valve regurgitation, there's a lot of leaking across the valve and that leak is going back into the, into the ventricle. Um, so over time, the ventricle has to enlarge or dilate to accommodate all that blood that's leaking back. And um, as Melinda's mentioned, you know, sometimes um, even before patients develop symptoms, symptoms can be very vague in different patients. Sometimes it can just be tiredness or shortness of breath, or sometimes advanced stages, you could actually get swelling of your legs like with heart failure. So there is more impetus now to prevent the ventricle reaching the point of becoming dysfunctional. And echocardiogram is very helpful in looking at the size of the ventricle and sometimes intervening before the ventricle reaches dysfunction, um, you know, in the setting of aortic valve regurgitation, I think it's a, it's a very good idea. Just like Melinda mentioned, if you're undergoing surgery for aortic, if the aorta is enlarged and you're going to fix the aorta, then I think addressing the aortic valve regurgitation is also important. Some of the caveats or differences with stenosis is that aortic valves which are leaking can actually be repaired. And Dr. Swenson has excellent experience in, in, uh, in looking at the aortic valve repair as an option instead of replacement. Uh, and that's, that's another important factor to um, look in, in in aortic valve regurgitation. All right, another surgical question is when is the reimplantation operation appropriate? So. We do this operation when the valve is not calcified and the aortic root is enlarged. And we do that for both bicuspid and uh, three leafed valves, the normal valves. We reimplant those within a plastic tube. That's why it's called a reimplantation operation. And as I mentioned earlier, the results are really excellent with that operation. The way we've modified it, it's very predictable, really excellent outcomes long term. And so when it comes to the reimplantation operation, if there's not much aortic valve regurgitation, like two patients I saw today, I will tell them the likelihood is 95% we can reimplant that valve in a new tube and keep their own valves. If there's severe regurgitation, the region of three or four percent, a three or four rating, so that's out of a score of four, and um, the valve uh, is a three leaflet valve, then it goes down to somewhere in the region of 85-90% we can keep the valve. And that's dependent if there are big holes in the leaflets or not. For bicuspid valves, we have also the option of a remodeling operation or a direct repair of the bicuspid valve and replacing the ascending aorta, which is also a very good operation. We've actually looked recently at whether it makes a difference replacing the ascending aorta at the same time with a bicuspid valve repair or only doing a repair and the results are about uh, equivalent for bicuspid valves and when there's a root involvement we've got what's called the remodeling operation or the reimplantation operation depending uh, on the situation that we find. So those are the uh, operations. Do we do Mininvasive operations for the root operations. So I developed the J incision in the mid 90s and I pushed it to the limits. We were doing so called arch elephant trunk procedures with that. I did a lot of reimplantations, root remodelings with that. 
But I, I must admit I've backed off on that because these are already complicated operations and it's very helpful to have a good view of the heart to make sure the heart is well protected during these operations. So I don't any longer do reimplantations as a min-invasive operation uh, for those uh, reasons. I think we can get a better long-term result with a full stenotomy as we call it. So there are questions about uh, FDA approval for the peers devices and various types of uh, braces for aortic valve repairs. So we've actually got a series of some 4,600 uh, aortic valve repairs, not necessarily with aneurysms, although when we brace the root, we have better results. And we feel the results are so good and any of these devices introduce more complexity and potential problems. And for example, with wrapping the aorta, for example, in Marfan's, what we see is when patients have had that done, it's a bit like a balloon. And as you know, as a child, if you took a balloon and squeezed it, what happened? The other two ends popped out. And that's what happens when people put wraps uh, around the aorta, other parts starts growing. So the operations are so safe nowadays and there's no reason to do wraps and so on when we can do a much more effective operation with better long-term durability. So for our ascending aortic replacements in patients with bicuspid valves, the risk of death was 0.25%, a quarter of a percent. And we know, as I mentioned earlier, that that's a very durable operation. And so we have not tried using these other devices, which score, can cause scarring and other problems over time. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of other uh, topics, which is endovascular treatment of the ascending aorta. Uh, that is a experimental procedure that can be sometimes used in very high risk patients when they're localized tears or dissection in the ascending aorta, particularly in elderly patients when other options aren't available. We are investigating that, but at, that, at this stage that is not a treatment uh, that uh, we would recommend as an alternative for any of the very safe procedures we do. What about patients with aortic enlargement who need TAVAR? We would not recommend a TAVAR on anybody whose aorta is more than 4.5 centimeters, just as we do with surgery, because there's a very high risk of aortic dissection with TAVAR and enlarged aorta. Um, what about, um, does all ascending aortic aneurysms require open surgery? I think I've answered that from the point of view of endovascular. And yes, for 99% uh, of patients, the ascending aorta replacement during an open operation, particularly if it's appropriate, min-invasive operation is a very safe uh, operation. So how does long does aortic surgery last? Um, in the bicuspid valves, as I said, there's a 2% risk of another operation within 15 years. In patients who have giant cell arteritis, there is a slightly higher risk over time, so we tend to do more extensive repairs in the patients with giant cell arteritis. Similarly, in patients with aortic dissection, we are tending to become more aggressive in the operation and particularly replacing the ascending aorta and arch even with stent grafts so that a second operation through the left chest or with a stent is easier to do. We talked about the modified uh, reimplantation David procedure and uh, as I said, we have about a three in a hundred failure rate at 10 years, my guess is it's going to be about 5 6% at 20 years. The results are really looking good with the way we've modified the operation and narrowing down the left uh, ventricular outflow tract with a Hagar's dilator that's normal for the patient's size and height. Um, how about biologic valves? Biologic valves durability is very dependent on the age of the person. The way we've looked at it, and you can look it up in the literature, is we've looked at the risk of re-operation within 12 years of surgery. So the younger the person is, the greater the risk. On the other hand, in the elderly, 
the biological valves hold up very well and there's always the option of doing a TAVR in those valves over time. Having said that, in patients who have aortic valve replacement at the Cleveland Clinic, there is no difference in the risk of death for a first time operation or a second or third operation, what we call a reoperation. And that's been the case since 2010. So at the Cleveland Clinic, there's no difference in risk between those operations. Um, we talked about life expectancy, but just to reiterate, in patients who have prophylactic operations and who have aneurysms replaced before aortic dissection, the life expectancy is normal. And we've got several studies that have shown that, including with a valve replacements. With aortic dissection, then, it's very dependent on blood pressure control after the procedure. All right, so there are a couple of other questions. Um, how often is a pacemaker needed after valve surgery? I'll start off, Sagar, with you. What about pacemakers after aortic surgery? So in general, for most patients with aortic valve replacement, they wouldn't need a pacemaker unless they have a prior conduction abnormality within their, um, within their rhythm, you know, something like a left bundle branch block or a right bundle branch block. If they have that going into surgery, then a, a, a very small number of patients may require a pacemaker after aortic valve replacement surgery. But in general, for most patients, pacemaker is usually not necessary. So usually we quote about a 1 or 2 percent risk of a pacemaker with a open aortic valve uh, replacement. It runs at about 8 to 10 percent for TAVR, although our team has had better results uh, than that. For a reimplantation operation, we usually run at about 2 to 3 percent risk of a pacemaker after that type of operation. Um, so let me turn to you, Melind, uh, as we wind things down here. What medications do you like to put patients on after aorta surgery or valve surgery? And uh, how often would you monitor patients, whether that's with MRI, CAT scans, or echoes? What are your thoughts on that? Thank you so much. So in terms of post-operative medications, uh, we have a preferential bias towards uh, keeping patients on beta blockers because you know, a lot of these patients have concomitant cardiovascular disease, LVH, et cetera, and it uh, helps with the blood pressure, it helps with the heart rate, uh, it helps with post-operative AFib, et cetera. So it is, uh, it is something that we would typically continue these patients on, at least in a low dose. Now, a lot of other post-op medications would be driven by what other concomitant conditions they have, especially if they have cholesterol problems, if they have hypertension that requires multiple medical therapies, then the bias would be for uh, the angiotensin uh, receptor family of, of drugs. Now, in terms of follow-up, uh, there is, Clearly, depending upon the extent of the disease uh, that the patient had and the extent of the disease that the patient had fixed is what is going to drive the follow-up regimen. So, high, so, for example, if you have somebody with a dissection that extends from the, the ascending aorta all the way to the groin, uh, and we have fixed the first part of the disease uh, by open-heart surgery, these patients will have a different and a lot more regimented, much more frequent uh, follow-up uh, schemata than somebody who just had a small area of ascending aorta that needed replacement and everything else is normal. Uh, now, having said that, it is important for an aortic patient is a lifelong patient. Aorta is a lifelong disease. So even if we have fixed you, uh, ostensibly fixed you, uh, you need to follow up. We like to see patients at least once a year and, and do their imaging. Now, if the valve is involved, then you need to also image uh, their valves using echocardiography and or occasionally MRI. If it's the aorta, then uh, a tomographic scan is important. If it is a dissected aorta that has had stent, stents placed, then you need a special type of CAT scan to look for what is called endoleaks. So it is, again, not a one-size-fits-all. 
the, import, the most important message that I would say is you are a lifelong patient and every care is individualized and should be discussed with your, providing, uh, with your expert provider. So, Sega, one last question for you. What do you do for patients who have uh, occasional loss of vision, who have had a aortic operation, or, and this, I think, is particularly relevant to mechanical valves? What do you do for those patients? Thanks, Dr. Swenson. Um, I think antiplatelet medications like aspirin um, is routinely used in patients with both valve replacements. I'm talking more biological valve replacements or valve repairs. And of course, for mechanical valve patients, you need to be on blood thinners. Um, you know, particularly Coumadin is the only one that's currently approved. So if somebody has a loss of vision, despite being on these medications, I think it's important that they're evaluated by neurology to uh, make sure there is no other reasons. But I think being on aspirin is the important thing for patients with biological valves or with uh, valve repairs. All right, just a couple of final points. Uh, one question was, um, how often do patients who have had modified reimplantations developing leaking valves? As I've said before, the risk of reoperation is about 3% within 10 years of surgery. Uh, I happen to be looking at some of our data on echocardiograms uh, today. So um, a, about 30% of patients who have one plus or less, which is our standard for leaving the operating room uh, after reimplantation operation, about 30% will develop a slight valve leak over time. Usually that occurs in the first year or two, but then after that it's stable over time. It doesn't seem to get worse. So about 30% will have one or two plus regurgitation. Now, if it progresses, then there is the risk of reoperation, which turns out to have been pretty uh, rare in our series of patients. In fact, the one series I was looking at today, uh, 22 patients needed another operation uh, for just under 1,000 patients, and six of those were patients who had Marfan syndrome. But as I said, we found no difference between patients who had Marfan syndrome and those who did not have Marfan syndrome. That is somewhat influenced that in patients with bicuspid valves who have reimplantation, they are more prone over time to get calcification of those valves because they are abnormal or leakage of those valves. So that does influence the outcomes. We know that long-term bicuspid valves do have a slightly higher rate of failure. In our experience, when we looked at 728 patients, the risk uh, was 9%. So in other words, what we call freedom from reoperation at 10 years was 91%. So the results are very good with repairs in this group of patients. I hope you have found this useful. It's uh, been a long session, but we've tried to cover all your questions and group them together. Thank you very much, and it was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity.